Well, good evening. I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the last Leading Voices in Public Health lecture event for this academic year, uh, which is appropriate because this is National Public Health Week, so I hope you all are enjoying Public Health Week so far. It's been good, it's been good to us. We have wanted to do an event on food uh, for several years. And we've wanted to do that because there's probably no area in public health where our thinking has changed as much as it has when it comes to food. Uh, a decade ago when we talked about food in a public health perspective, we talked about famine, food insufficiency, or micronutrient insufficiency in the sense of birth defects from folic acid and so on. But over the last couple of years, we've come to realize that the relationship of food and health is much more complicated than that. Obviously, the issues related to the sustainability of how we grow food, the environmental impact of how we transport food, uh, the, the relationship of food and culture and culture and health, uh, we obviously the changing diet as it relates to obesity and other chronic diseases, suddenly really in the last 10 years we've completely rethought food from a public health standpoint. And so the reasonable question is why haven't we done a Leading Voices event on food before? And the easy answer is that it's such a complicated, complex issue that we couldn't find a single speaker who could address the totality of the issue. So fortunately, I was able to run into our two MCs this evening, and with their help, we put together a true multimedia event that's going to cover the totality of food, past, present, and future, and really help us rethink food. Our two MCs for the evening are Rachel Ward, who's a doctoral student in the College of Public Health, and the president of the newly inaugurated ETSU Farmers Market that opened today for the first time. And Camille Kingsolver, who is a social advocate and a co-author of the best-selling book, Animal Vegetable Miracle. So please join me in welcoming our two MCs, Rachel and Camille. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. We live in a world where nearly everyone we meet has a different opinion about what people should be eating. The media gives us constant and often conflicting information about what foods are good and what foods are bad. At supermarkets and restaurants, we're faced with the overwhelming task of sifting through all the information and labels to find something we feel okay about consuming. Or we just tune it all out, which is easier. For our ancestors who lived and farmed in these mountains, food was food, plain and simple. People grew what they could and ate what they grew. People learned about the plants and animals that they shared the mountains with so that they could forage and hunt in order to sustain themselves. Out of this combination of domestic and wild foods that composed the early Appalachian diet grew a food culture as unique as we are. As mountain people, our food culture is as much a part of our heritage as the music, stories, and crafts that have come out of Appalachia. By celebrating that culture, we bring ourselves back to the food that is local, sustainable, and nourishing. We don't always consider the connections between food, agriculture, and public health. However, exploring these connections may reveal creative solutions to challenges we face in our region and nation, ranging from environmental degradation, struggling economies, and the obesity epidemic. Tonight, we'd like to consider some of the ongoing challenges and opportunities our local agriculture community commonly faces. As Camille mentioned, agriculture has always played a central role in this incredibly diverse and beautiful region. We benefit from innovative organizations and individuals who are working to improve the economic vitality of our region and our regional farms encourage consumption of locally produced foods, and preserve Appalachian traditions for future generations. Tonight, you'll hear the perspectives of some of these innovators in person and through documentary film. 
Our hope is that their stories will allow us to reflect on the ways that agriculture and food impact the health of our communities. To begin, we'll observe how Ramps built community in Flag Pond, Tennessee, in the film Ramps and Ruritans. The fifth film in a series of documentaries about Appalachian foodways, Ramps and Ruritans was developed through a partnership between the Flag Pond Ruritan Club and ETSU's Office of University Relations and Center for Appalachian Studies and Services. The Appalachian Foodway series has covered red hot dogs in southwest Virginia, soup beans in Greenville, Tennessee, the food traditions of Cuban immigrants in East Tennessee, and the iconic Ridgewood Barbecue in Bluff City. The Ramp Film Project began in May of 2007 with a ramp dig in Unicoi County. All of the work on the film was done in-house at ETSU, and the hammer dulcimer, dulcimer you'll hear was played by Justin Watkins of Kingsport, Tennessee, who is also a student in the Bluegrass Old Time and Country Music Studies program here at ETSU. We've dug ramps all of our life in these mountains. The first thing in the spring you do is you go out to the woods and get you a mess of ramps. The Cherokee traditionally believed that ramps needed to be consumed at least once a year to purify the blood. There was something in them that made you healthy. And I do believe too that there was something in them that made other people stay away from you so that you weren't able to catch those uh, communicable diseases. So I think they work both ways. We always say, Country boy can't shed off in the summertime and without, in the spring without a good mess of ramps and then he's, he's ready to go. That's the first thing we eat in the spring is a good mess of ramps and potatoes. It was believed that people sort of became very lethargic in the wintertime and they would uh, sit around too much and their blood did become sort of thick and lazy. And so in the springtime it was uh, time to have a mess of ramps so it could thin things down and cause things to flow and uh, give you more energy. Well, when we say we're going to go get us a mess of fish or a mess of ramps or a mess of taters, we, it's just all we can eat of that. It's like going to a restaurant of all you can eat and eat all you can. That's a mess. That's a <laughs> the Cherokee word for ramp is wasting. Cherokees would say agi o shiha, wasting aquaduli. That means I am hungry. I want some ramps. I grew up in the Birdtown community of the Kuala Boundary, which is the Cherokee Indian Reservation, as most people call it, on a farm with my father and nine brothers and sisters. We were pretty well mountain people. I'm a mixture of Scott and Cherokee. To eat them raw, I like to get them when they're real young, before they get strong and uh, uh, just when they first come up. We would go back in the mountains dig the ramps and on an open fire back there, fry them and eat them back there. Well, it looks somewhat like an onion. Uh, it's got a wider blade on it. The blades are flat, uh, about the color of an onion. And uh, the ramp part of it, the head of it, is uh, white and uh, uh, looks somewhat like an onion, but it don't get as big as an onion does. It's uh, They're not real hard to kind of like a, uh, it's between garlic and a, uh, an onion, I guess you would say. It's, it's kind of, it's in the garlic, it's in the leek family. It's kind of like a, a leek or an onion, but it's, it's just, it's got its own, its own taste. It don't, don't taste like either one of them, but I don't know how you exactly how it tastes. You just have to eat yourself. We usually dig up for around 3,000 feet, something like that. When you come up here to dig ramps on Higgins Creek, you've got to dig on this side of the mountain. You can see the vegetation here, and there's not any vegetation over there yet. This, the evening sun keeps it warm on this side, and everything comes up and grows. It'll be a long time before it gets all vegetation in over there. Anybody want water now? 
You notice how black the dirt is? Rich dirt. That's what they're like. Real. Black, rich dirt. There's nothing else in the mountains like them. We're uh, loosening the roots uh, on it. Uh, you can pull it up. Now these roots, we take them and take them back somewhere and put them out. We don't destroy you. Eat them. You eat up to right there. It likes damp on the northern side. They won't grow nowhere but on the northern side of a mountain. hand prong of Higgins Creek right up under the Ball Mountain. The Ball Mountain's right, right back this way. But you can get, you can keep going this way and you'll come out up on top of the Ball Mountain where they, the, that gated community and all that is up there. We're finding a good crop this year. They're a little bit hard to dig but uh, that's due to wet weather we've had this year and the snow and stuff. They're better and stronger this year. The roots are. So far we've found a pretty good crop of them. The male and the female, there are two different kinds of them. You'll notice when you're digging them, one of them is white with a uh, stalk and the other one is red. And uh, you have to have both of them to produce because one of them in the fall will uh, have uh, seed on it and the other one won't. And then the wind blows the seed off and scatters them out through the mountains and that's the way they come up. I do have memories about ramp digs when my father would take us back up in the mountains. He was very careful to instruct us not to take the roots of the ramps. We would take a sharp knife with us and we would cut those ramps off above the root system. And Dad said that they would always come back that way and we would always have plenty. And that's one of the things Cherokee people believe that you only took what you needed. And you took it in a very specific way. They were appreciative of all those things around them, and they felt like that was very important. If you dig in the same place all the time, you dig so many out that uh, they won't reproduce. So we try to go different spots and, and dig. That way we don't dig them all out, and uh, they will uh, come back. We try to go from uh, either two years uh, apart from where we dig all the time and that way that gives the seed chance to come back and produce again. It's been such a, a wet winter it's we, we've got more rain more snow everything the ramps have got a lot bigger root on them and it looks like they're going to be bigger ramp, bigger ramps than we've had before so it, they're really growing good. We usually try to dig uh, <laughs> two or three bags at a time when we go because it's, it's so high up on the mountain. There was a guy called me last week wanted to 20 pound of ramps. He said there's two or three more people digging him 20 pound and that he would give us like 200 and some dollars for them. And he was shipping them to New York to a, to a big restaurant up there. A chef fixed them in New York. So I don't know what they pay for him in New York. Apparently good money because he was giving a lot for them. I told him that we done ours in one pound bundles and sold them for two or three dollars a piece and First come, first serve. We couldn't save him any. <laughs> Everyone's going to be treated the same. We don't save them back for anybody. You have years that are not as plentiful. But see, it takes so many years from the five years for to really start producing, spreading out. But we've done this for 20 years now, and we haven't had no trouble of uh, locating them. We don't dig in the same place every year. We go different places in the mountains and dig. This is branch lettuce and it grows near a stream normally and older people used to gather uh, branch lettuce and ramps in the early spring of the year and uh, older folks would uh, 
uh, gather the lettuce and the ramps and take it home and wash it and chop it up into bite-sized pieces and make cornbread and they would fry bacon to get the hot oil and they would put it over the ramps and branch lettuce and they called it killing the ramps and branch lettuce. The ramp, if it is eaten raw, is very, very stinky. And it smells bad and it'll the smell will stay with you for several days. Um, when we were growing up and in school, the kids would eat them raw so that they'd get to sit in the hall during the day um, because the teachers didn't want them in the classroom. I mean, it smelled up the whole classroom. When I was going to Rocky Fork School, I, they, would, they would send you to the house or make you sit out in the hall if you eat ramps. And uh, I live close to school, so they just sent me home when I, when I went to school eating ramps. <laughs> I remember going to Sweetwater School and they, they only had two rooms and we had what we call the cloak room where the coats were put. And if the boys come in and they'd eat raw ramps, they had to sit in the cloak room that day. <laughs> well, my mother was in the boarding school and I attended the day school when the old boarding schools were closed down. And um, when the child would eat ramps, the uh, teachers who were not from this area, most of them are from up north someplace and out west, would put the child out in the hallway for two or three days. Every time they came to school, they'd give them their assignments and set them in the hall because they, they smelled so bad that they couldn't tolerate it. What they didn't realize was that this is, may have been all that that child had to eat for breakfast that morning. And the Cherokee people would think that was a good thing because it was uh, wholesome food. I never did get sent home from school, but uh, I've ate them and went. I remember in uh, 1955, uh, my dad traded for a new 55 Chevrolet car over here at Fairclaws in Johnson City. It was on Saturday morning. We'd went to the ramp patch on Friday afternoon, and we came over to give them our car and get the new car. And uh, my dad was inside the building doing the paperwork on the car, and me and my brother and her mother was out in the used car lot, uh, standing around, talking, waiting on him. And uh, there was some guys looking at the used car. Well, we got pretty close to them, and one of the guys turned to the other and he said, Shoo, goodness, he said, you smell this like a ramp. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, we just kind of got back out of the way then. <laughs> we uh, fried them in potatoes uh, with streaked meat, you know, fried them in the grease of the streaked meat. Now, my wife would... Uh, she would put ramps in dill pickles. In that jar is uh, dill pickles made with ramps. There's two ramp bulbs in the top and two ramp bulbs in the bottom, along with fresh dill heads. My mother found a dill pickle recipe, but it called for garlic, and so she decided that she would try ramps. Um, and they worked beautifully. I grew up at a time when we had to make do. You used what you had. We didn't grow garlic. We didn't go to the store to buy the garlic bulbs. We still make do. <laughs> That's just a trait of the mountain people. Well, if you freeze them, they'll last a year. I've still got ramps in my freezer from last year. I, cut the, I take the green part off, put them in a pint jar, and just seal it and set them in the freezer. And when the leaves dies down and the, the growth in the forest gets up, you can't find them. You couldn't find them at the first of June. That's the reason a lot of people will put them in glass jars and freeze them. We fry them in potatoes. We, we just cut them off about, about here. About that much of them, we throw that part away. A lot of people eat that, but we don't. We just fry them in potatoes or fix them in eggs, fix them in cornbread, fix them in meatloaf, whatever you want to fix it. Anything, Anything you cook, you can cook with a ramp. You eat it for the leaves. A lot of people will take these leaves and put them in a salad. 
we eat basically the the bulb as well as the leaves, which are, I think are excellent greens. <laughs> They put them in scrambled eggs, uh, uh, deep fry them, put them in meal, you know, and deep fry them. Uh, I've never ate them that way, but they say they're good. Uh, one old gentleman used to live in Irwin, used to come up there to a uh, neighbor of ours, and every spring he would come a time or two, you know, and go to the ramp patching. And he experimented with them a whole lot, I guess. He said they was good in anything you put them in but your coffee. He said they didn't work in the coffee. <laughs> Best thing I can describe it is garlic. Tastes more like garlic to me than anything else that I know of. That I taste. And the Yankees love them. <laughs> Do they really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got some friends, I was telling him, they're wanting to move to Flag Pond, and uh, they wanted me to mail them some out of New in New Jersey. <laughs> I said, uh-uh, I ain't going to do that. People don't realize how much they'd have to pay if they was in New York for a mess of ramps. Well, we just get the eight or ten of us and go to the mountains and, and dig all the ramps we can dig. To to sell them at the ramp festival or to put them in food for people to eat at the ramp festival and we sell that to them but we don't really have a lot extra to sell but we do have some not many as far as putting the festival on if we didn't have a lot of volunteers for the community why we couldn't put it on we don't have enough membership in the real town club to do it it's one of the biggest things that happens in flag pond i've been told uh, there was an old swamp-like thing, pond, uh, there somewhere in Flag Pond that had some plants that grew up in it that they call flags, and I feared that that's the way it got its name. It's just off Interstate 26, uh, about uh, five miles from the North Carolina line. We have People from several different states come. We've never changed our menu. You get ramps and potatoes. Uh, of course, if you ask, we'll give you their full raw. Uh, soup beans, uh, well, pinto beans, uh, coleslaw, cornbread, and a drink and a dessert. Oh, and streaked meat, bacon or streaked meat. There's your spoons and forks. <laughs> yum, yum. Good eating. <laughs> uh, we uh, dig about 300 pounds, I guess, to uh, put in potatoes, and then we usually have about a hundred, two hundred bunches to sell. So it takes you at least four or five days to dig ramps to get ready for it. If you're going to feed a thousand people, you got to dig. <laughs> takes a lot of ramps to do. We sold right at a thousand place last year. Whoever's available at the time we come, we just gather up and come to the ramp patch. Oh, it, it's it's a, like a family and friends fun time. We enjoy it, look forward to it each year. A lot of hard work, but it's, it's rewarded. We try to clean at the Flag Pond School to get it ready. It's very run down, but we try to clean the best we can. We have the old Flag Pond School building that we use for a community center. Part of our money goes to the upkeep of hits, you know, electric bill and what have you. It's important to the community because uh, when the schools consolidated, uh, the sense of community was kind of gone. And so the Ruotan wanted to do something to bring back that sense of community and not lose touch with neighbors and friends. And uh, now the festival has grown to the place where people plan their vacations around the festival and come back. Um, to be a part of the community and continue that. 
but it started just as a community thing, to build community so that we didn't lose um, the sense of community. Today I have made cornbread, um, I have served on the line, I've fried some potatoes, I've peeled potatoes, I've cut ramps. <laughs> It's funny that women can cook their whole life and never get any credit for it. But a man one time a year can fry up potatoes, ramps, and bacon and gets all the attention. So I'm speaking for all the women. <laughs> Come and eat with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've eaten ramps all my life. We love ramps and we love to eat ramps. Those tricky thing is if you eight ramps in the spring, you'll live to see another year. If you, uh, if you have a mess of ramps once a year, you'll live to see the next spring for the next crop of ramps to come in. I'll eat you something pretty quick so I won't live the next, next spring anyway. <laughs> So that documentary was a celebration of something that's been traditionally eaten and celebrated in this region. And here to talk with us tonight about some current issues and movements in sustainable agriculture is Tom Peterson of Abingdon, Virginia. Mr. Peterson is the Agriculture Education Coordinator for Appalachian Sustainable Development, a regional nonprofit that seeks to strengthen and diversify the rural economy in Southwest Virginia and East Tennessee. He works to support the Appalachian Harvest Network, regional farmers markets, and others interested in sustainable agriculture through developing workshops and farm tours and offering personal farm consultations. Mr. Peterson is a founding member of the Appalachian Farmers Market Association. 
He also farms a market garden called Blue Door Garden with his wife, Denise, and their twin sons. Please welcome Mr. Peterson. Somewhere up here, there's, oh, there it is. That's, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I do want to know what the fellow says, that ramp eaters are always alone unless, and they never showed the back of the t-shirt. Anybody here know what it says on the back? No. No. I guess I'll just have to wonder about that one. Um, but I want to thank you all for the invitation to come speak. My name is Tom Peterson. Like she said, I work with Appalachian Sustainable Development. And I've been growing organic foods and, um, and selling organic foods and eating organic foods for about 25 years with my wife and my kids and uh, places as far as uh, Vermont and Illinois and now we live in Abingdon, Virginia. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the notion of a food hub. The, the reason I want to talk about a food hub is because that's a great way to understand how you can help to build a more healthy rural food economy where you live, and, but it has a lot of different forms. So basically, when I'm talking about a food hub, it's just a place that acts as a distribution point. So food is coming, producers are producing food, it's going someplace where then consumers can come and get to that food. And it could be a lot of forms, you know, we're talking about grocery stores, uh, farmers markets, ramp festivals, uh, or, you know, I know Johnson, Johnson City has this, this uh, this new thriving coop group that are uh, people selling eggs from, uh, from household flocks. All these things are places where food is brought to a place where people can get at it. So a local food hub are focusing on those activities which really facilitate the increased production and consumption and sale of local foods. You know, things like the farmer's market that happened today here on the ETSU campus. That's really exciting development in terms of a, one idea of a food hub. And they come, like I said, in a lot of different forms. But the strength of local food hubs comes through the efforts to link and connect all these various activities. So if we take the, the ETSU farmer's market as an example, by itself it's a wonderful food hub, a great place where people are growing food, they're coming to sell the food, and other folks can come and enjoy it and take it into their lives. It's a great connection. But if that food hub can connect to other food hubs around where it is, like, for example, I don't know if you've got that local food guide that I gave up. She's holding up the local food guide. So that's an example of not necessarily a place where you're buying food, but it's a, a, a book that has a, a series, a, a bunch of farmers in there, a bunch of farmers markets, different places where you can access local foods. So it spreads that word out to more people. It makes it more uh, a, a bigger effort. So we're all familiar with farmer's markets. And we've got a lot of them to choose from in this region. We're really lucky because we've got a place that's very rich in terms of food history and in food production. There's a lot of good food produced here. We've got a great climate for it. And often they can be effective hubs for increasing local food activity and strong drivers for economies. I want to talk just a little bit about farmer's markets because they're exciting places. Uh, I live in Abingdon, Virginia, and the state of Virginia, one thing that they're promoting now through their, uh, their Department of Agriculture is this $10 challenge. And the idea being that if every household in Virginia could pledge to buy $10 of local foods every week, what would that do to the economy? And by their figures, it would generate $1.65 billion in the state of Virginia. That's money that's going to local farmers. That's money that's going, being reinvested in local communities. That's a big number. That's a lot of dollars. And that's just $10 a week for a household. So those of you who buy local foods, who sharp maybe at farmer's markets or other places, what does $10 buy you? It's not a huge investment. You know, if you're, if you're buying like a free-range chicken, one free-range chicken is probably going to shoot your $10 for a week. Or you know, uh, a, a few pounds of potatoes. It's really a pretty easy goal, if you think about it, $10 a week on local foods. So I just thought, got to think about Johnson City. We'll put this back to where we are now. So by my figuring, when I went online and did all my little data searching, and say, I figured out there are about 24,000 households in Johnson City. So if all those 24,000 households in Johnson City 
each pledged to spend $10 every week, $10 a week, it's not a lot, on local foods, that's $240,000 every week that is going in the pockets of local farmers and food producers. That's pretty good. And that's over $12 million a year, and that's just Johnson City, if you think about this for the whole region. So little simple movements like this can really have an impact you know, a really profound impact on local economies. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty great. People like myself, I mean, I grow food and I sell food at a farmer's market. But, you know, every time I'm at the farmer's market, I'm spending way more than $10 on other stuff that's there. People, you know, I'm a, I'm a vegetable producer. So all of the meats that I eat, I buy those at the farmer's market. Eggs I buy at the farmer's market. Other vegetables that I don't produce. So I'm there selling and, and and enjoying the, 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 uh, the economic activity that's generated by that farmer's market that's helping to support my family and my life. But at the same time, I'm also engaging in activity with other farmers. So it's a really exciting thing. And so just have this $10 challenge in the back of your head. It's a really, really impressive tool for building these local economies. So how do we help this to happen? That's, the whole, that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit, was how do we make this happen? How do we get more activity, more local food hubs, more local foods in our lives, in our, in our region happening, so that this guy can keep smiling and selling his beets year after year after year? Well, the first thing to do as individuals is to seek out those local foods in our communities. Find out where those local food hubs are. You know, are you going to go to the farmer's market at ETSU? Are you going to go to a local health food store? Are you going to seek out farmers directly? There's a lot of different avenues for doing that, but it, it's up to you as individuals to make that happen, to make that, make that seeking happen. And be open to trying some new things. How many of you have ever tried a husk cherry? Good for you. How was it? <laughs> was it delicious? I've never tried a husk cherry. It's, it's, it's a... But I, if I was there, I would, have, I would have taken one out of that bowl and given it a try. It looks like a little tomatillo. And develop new relationships with the folks who raise food in your community. So those of you who may have gone to the farmer's market today here at ETSU, chances are that you met some folks that you've never met before. And you've got a chance to try the foods, hopefully to talk to them a little bit and learn a little bit more about what they're doing and why they're doing it to try to get that excitement going in, in your own communities. 2001, the year I moved back down to Southwest Virginia, in East Tennessee, there were only four major active farmers markets, and they were in the, in the major hubs. There was one here in Johnson City, in the, each of the tri-cities, Johnson City, Bristol, and Kingsport, each had farmers markets. At that point, they were all kind of together and connected. And then there was a farmers market in Greens, Greenville, Tennessee. Today, there's over 12, whoa, that's the wrong button, we're going back. There's over 12 with new communities coming on every year. So it's a new, it's exciting, and it's a growing thing. Communities are starting to realize that farmers markets not only are a great opportunity for economic activity, but they're also great community events. They bring people together. They make things happen, make it exciting. And increasingly, restaurants are seeking local farmers to provide fresher, more delicious, more interesting foods. And these restaurant chefs are going and visiting farmers markets and meeting these farmers and making these connections happen. So as eaters, you know, people are, you know, as eaters, we're going to farmer's markets, we're eating at these restaurants, we can encourage them to do these things and, to, and have more local foods on their menus. And lots of eaters are getting together to form these, what are called slow food chapters or, or eating clubs to get together to share. Uh, even gardening clubs are doing garden or farm tours or things like that. There's a lot of different ways that people are getting excited and involved in local food things. This is at a farmer's market in Abingdon, and this is, uh, uh, Chef Jason Campbell. So involving members of the community in the local food activity helps that to spread as well. So we're sharing the wealth and the joy of farming and of food. How many of you here are grow, any of you producers of food? Put your hand up real quick if, you're, if you grow food. Even for yourself at a little garden or something. Okay, good. Good for you. That's something you should be doing. Growing your own food, getting involved and in making that happen. As growers, it's partially up to us. Oh, it's partially up to us to invite folks out and to get people involved in what we're doing. So people love to have farm tours. People love to go out and visit and see what's going on and see it firsthand. And that you know that kind of invitation is something that's really exciting and can make 
make the local food system really grow. And the last thing I'll say, you know, grow some of your own food. It's really not that difficult. And even though some of you that are living here don't have big yards or farms that you live on, food, you know, you can grow food in pots or in boxes on your porch. And it, and it, it just brings a new element of the whole enjoyment of food into your life. Um, and they're great places for kids, too. If you've got kids and uh, young children or if you've got children in the neighborhood, it's a great place for them to be involved and, and learn about food and learn about uh, the wonders of nature. And, you know, school gardens, too, if, you, if you've got kids that are in the school system, getting them involved in food production through school gardens. These are things that, as parents, we can get involved. We can get, in, get these things uh, moving through the PTA or through other activities in the school to try to get some of these activities in the schools and get those kids outside a little bit, get them out of the classroom from time to time. And adults like to learn too. This is a, a shiitake mushroom workshop that my wife put on a while ago. This actually was at uh, Rural Resources, I think, wasn't it? Was this one there? Um, we were talking about ramps. My wife is, also works with, with food education. She just recently, this is past Saturday, did a ramps workshop up in Abingdon. And we had ramp seeds and ramp bulbs for people to take home and plant in our refrigerator for about a week. And I can attest to the fact that they are very pungent. And even now, you open the refrigerator, there's still that little ghost of ramps in there. But it's, uh, uh, it's exciting that, that people are interested in learning about more about growing their own food. So the more we as consumers can learn about how our food is raised, the more our local food hubs thrive. So the more that this activity happens. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Appalachian Sustainable Development, the work that we do to try to encourage this. And I want to encourage you all to be a part of that work as too, because it's not that difficult. And there are ways that you can really tap in to what's happening to the local food systems work here. So several things that are going on. One, we mentioned, uh, blah, 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 blah. so Appalachian Farmers Market Association is a relatively new group, a couple years old, that we, we meet once a month. And it's a group of, of local farmers market managers that get together. We talk about what's working, what kind of support we need, what kind of information we need, what kind of policy work we need to be working on in our local governments to try to encourage and grow these whole ideas of farmers markets, to make them better, more, more vibrant, more effective ways to sell food. Um, you can visit this website, www.appma.org for a guide for markets near you and information about events and local farmers. And the local food guide that Rachel held up earlier is also on there in an electronic form. So that's a place where you can go and actually search out farmers, farmers markets, and other businesses, restaurants, health food stores that are actively selling local foods in your communities. So I'd encourage you to go there. Uh, the local food guide, I would have loved to have brought a ton of copies, but we're right in the stage now where we're updating the guide for the, uh, 2012. And so we've got just a few copies left from last year. We're getting ready to finalize and get some more printed out. But if you go visit your local farmer's markets, you'll be able to find those local food guides there. Or you can always get them through Appalachian Sustainable Development. It's a great tool for really, again, connecting with the farmers and, and other local foods that are in your area. Appalachian Harvest is a group that is a wholesale network for selling certified organic produce that's grown in this region. So we've got about 25 farmers throughout Tennessee and southwest Virginia that are growing certified organic produce and they're selling it together through this network. You know, wholesale, when I say wholesale, I'm talking this is going to Ingalls or Food City, um, to supermarket chains or to other distributors that are selling food on the wholesale on, to, to wider markets. And those kind of markets are virtually impossible for an individual farmer to access because one, they generally don't have enough production and two, they don't have the infrastructure, the trucks and the coolers and the ability to take those foods and store them and then, and then drive them long distances to these markets. So by collecting the efforts of dozens of farmers, then that food we can, we can have it in quantities and in uh, the ability to move it so that those supermarkets are interested. So if you shop at an Ingalls here, if you shop at an Earth Fair or a Whole Foods, any of those large supermarkets, look for the Appalachian Harvest label. And if you see that, that means that's food that's been grown, certified organically here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And that's pretty exciting. And for a 
for a grower who's out in Flag Pond, Tennessee, or in Stickleyville, Tennessee, you know, that, having access to a market like that, where, you know, it's going to Atlanta, it's going to DC, it's going to Knoxville, that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for those growers because otherwise they'd be really stuck as to where to move and where to sell large quantities of produce. Learning Landscapes is a school garden program and we're excited that we're, we're partnering with Bristol Virginia Schools this year to do some uh, potato gardens at their schools and so that's going to be an exciting development too. It's been uh, it's great to see the kids working and, and, and learning in the gardens. The picture earlier of the, of the young boy with the praying mantis on his hands, that was taken at a learning landscapes garden. And then a new project we're doing, Grow Appalachia, is a, a garden program where we're helping mountain families learn how to grow their own food again. And generally, it's just, this is targeted through the food bank system. So we've got a lot of families that are struggling to feed themselves. They're going to food banks. They're, um, they're having a hard time figuring out how to feed themselves and feed themselves well. This is a program that's actually teaching the skills and providing some tools and some support so they can grow healthy, nutritious gardens in their own homes. And so that's a, another exciting way to get local foods into the diets of everyone in this region. So I invite you to come involved with the work. You know, visit our website. It's, uh, it, it'll be on the last slide. It'll be there. And, and you know, participate in the joy of actively supporting local foods because it's a really, really important thing for our local economy and uh, it's delicious. So together we can help make Southern Appalachia a tastier place to live and food can be fun. <laughs> a little tomato man peeking out from the cucumbers there. Um, I think he just caught a whiff of the ramps. He's like, whoa! So we're all, I mean, we're all in it for the benefits. Food is a benefit to us and we all love to eat food and if we realize that the food choices that we make can have really profound influences on our local economies and the people who live there, then we can start making decisions in terms of our food that are really going to benefit our communities and benefit ourselves and benefit our health. So the more we can see, feel, touch, smell, and taste local farms, the better we all are. So I, invo I invite you all to get involved and taste the difference. We're going to be hearing some more about other ways that you can get involved and through uh, you know, trying to get some farm to school programs going. I know Appalachian Harvest has, has sold produce in the past to the ETSU food service. It'd be great to get that up and going again. There's uh, exciting programs happening in rural resources that Kat Sally's going to talk about later. And there's now exciting things happening here too with this uh, ETSU farmers market. So I'm glad that you guys are having, you know, you're part of this, this growing movement of things. And I'm glad you, you thought enough to come out tonight to learn more about local foods. Um, so I want to thank you for that and I want to let this program continue. I want to, I'm excited to learn more uh, that the ramp thing was, was fantastic. I didn't, I didn't know so much about ramps before, but it was, um, and I'm glad to see too that we are not too late to catch in on the ramp festival this year, the second Saturday in May, so up in Flag Pond. So thank you all very much. This is my name and contact information if you have any questions. And, if you want to learn more about local foods, or if you want to learn more about growing food, feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to work with you. Thank you. Now we will view a documentary film developed, uh, produced by Jason Grau. He's a student in ETSU's uh, radio, TV, and film program. And uh, he uh, made a documentary film on Unicoi County Farmer's Kitchen. Back in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, the uh, government started buying out uh, tobacco allotments and uh, the whole initial goal was to do away with uh, tobacco uh, because it had been proven to be uh, hazardous to your health. Uh, unfortunately, there was, uh, this was a, a means for people to uh, 
make a living, uh, especially people in Unicoi County, which was largely uh, uh, a farming county back years ago. And uh, it was a tradition to have a tobacco allotment and grow tobacco every year for many of the, of the local farmers. Uh, this took away um, some of their revenues that uh, would be coming in, their way of making a living. And uh, so they've, some have diversified, some have been able to uh, find other ways of, of uh, making a living in farming, and some have not. Some have left the farm and sold out and gone to uh, public work or uh, uh, industry and whatnot. Um, there are a few family farms left, and there are a few farms that are operational. Uh, most of them are uh, doing things like um, uh, strawberries, blueberries, um, truck crops, uh, not much livestock because we don't have, uh, we're, we're a mountainous community here, so we don't have a lot of pasture ground for livestock. Uh, we have apple growers and uh, so on. Uh, and that's, uh, that's basically what it's amounted to, is that over the years, uh, we've had to learn to adjust, and some of us have and some of us haven't, unfortunately. <laughs> the farmer's kitchen idea uh, first came about, actually, uh, through my membership in the Unicori Rural Town Club. Our uh, local Rural Town Club, uh, as a, our major fundraiser, is to make strawberry preserves and uh, apple butter in the fall. Uh, there is a, a need for something like that in the community for people not only for just fundraising type things, but for families who want to uh, uh, can their own vegetables uh, to use in the winter time to help on uh, their food expenses. Uh, there's also opportunities for the entrepreneurial types that maybe have a uh, salsa recipe that uh, they would like to try to produce and be able to sell it. There's, there's strict government guidelines about food and how you can process it and how you are able to sell it or not able to sell it. And you have to follow those guidelines and you need a, uh, uh, an, uh, an authorized or a commercial type of kitchen uh, that's inspected uh, in order to be able to sell anything that you can like that. Uh, for instance, if they uh, grew strawberries or blueberries and they wanted an extra way to be able to sell their product, uh, they could come down there and go through the kitchen, the community kitchen, and, and uh, can that product and have it inspected and labeled and be able to sell it commercially in the, in the grocery store. So it's, a, it's a, uh, an opportunity for people to be able to uh, preserve their own private food for private use, plus it's a, 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 an incubator uh, for people that, entrepreneurs that want to get into business. It's a, it's a small business incubator at the same time. several other uh, documentary films that were developed by uh, ETSU radio, TV, and film program students out in the foyer. Um, now we're going to transition a little bit and uh, look at the future of local foods, or future of food. Um, and we'll be hearing from Ron Fink. Um, Ron is the director of the Bristol, Tennessee City School Nutrition Program. And for the last two years, he's been working in his school district to promote healthy eating and menu changes. He's a self-taught chef, and he carries his expertise into his programming. Uh, now he'll share about his expertise in taking uh, districts down a healthier school districts down a healthier path. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for letting me share with you this little journey that I've taken. 
Uh, if I can figure this out, you can, care, you can see that I kind of have a, a warped sense of food. Uh, I love that. I just think that's great. Okay. Let me tell you who we are, just so you know what we're talking about. I am Bristol City Schools. Um, nine years I've been there. I am a um, teacher by trade, so that's kind of helped as I've moved down this road. I am a heart attack survivor. I am an urban vegetable gardener and reasonable chef. I'm okay. <laughs> Bristol, Tennessee City Schools MILF program. You got to know how big we are to know what I'm talking about. Bristol, Tennessee is a fairly small school district. And I've tried to do some things with a very small school district. To put that in perspective, Sullivan County is four times my size. Hamlin County is about six times my size. We're doing about 1,000 breakfasts a day. 24 lunches per day, 40 staff, seven sites. I run a budget of about $1.8 million. Um, and part of this, too, is everybody likes to tell me about school nutrition and what school nutrition would be like, but they don't know what food distribution is like, they don't understand finances, and they don't understand skill level of staff and kids. Okay, So that's kind of what this is about, too. Finances are a big deal to me. I am a standalone entity in Bristol, Tennessee City Schools. The mayor runs his budget, the director of schools runs his budget, I run my budget. We're three separate financial entities. Currently, 279 is a benchmark for a free lunch from USDA. That becomes the benchmark for the money I have to work with to give kids lunches in the public schools. Uh, that translates to about $1.12. That's how much money I have to buy the food that I feed kids every day that go through my lunch lines in the schools. Personnel 112, equipment 56 cents. Um, I want to show you a couple things here. Um, all I'm doing is keeping my revenues in front of my expenses and feeding kids. It's a constant game just like you do your own personal budget. It's a constant game of keeping my expenses which are in the red below my income. Uh, this year may be the first year that I don't do that and I'll probably tap my reserves to make budget. This is interesting, uh, or it is to me, hopefully to you. I, I track things, I'm kind of a number guy if you can't tell. Um, I track things and this is lunch participation by month, okay, and by year. The highest one in the blue dots is 07, 08. And you can see that in 08, 09, we had a price increase. We took out our fryers at the middle school, BMS fryer, and we took out our fryer at the high school. And so this right here is now my participation. And you can see that it's the lowest of five years. The healthier we get, the more we get rid of fried foods, the more kids choose to bring their lunch from home or high school middle kids. They just won't eat with you. That's just the way it goes. Cool. Give you an idea of who we are, another thing, 60% of the meals that go through my cash registers are free meals paid for by the USDA, and we're not a terribly poor system. Johnson County, 70, 80% of their meals are free, at least. Um, students, you gotta kinda know students. I love to take pictures of students um, and their meals. These are, these, this is what I'm competing against at the elementary level, and I know the schools and I have slideshows of what kids bring from home. And if I showed you the slideshows, you can see the, stu the students' meals change by different socioeconomic status schools. My wife is here. She teaches a very, at a very poor school. Uh, that would be here and here. Uh, these are some of my more affluent schools where you see a parent actually went to the trouble to cut fresh produce and send it with the child. That's actually a fairly affluent school where we simply bought prepackaged things. Uh, these are. What I call, this one here particularly is the worst packed lunch ever, right? Everything there is not labeled for individual sale. So that means they have bought those items in bulk. And also this was a third grader, um, and I doubt that he got up and did that himself. So that was packed by a parent. Um, the reason I kind of started on this journey is I've never really been that pleased with what we've been doing. Okay, it's, it's, we've done it. It's, it's not that great. We actually asked our commercial food provider to come in and show us how to do things better. It's, it's a great company. It's like Cisco, Gordon's, IJ. And they have chefs on duty. They have dietitians on duty. And they came in and basically took our chicken nuggets, put them in a wrap with lettuce and tomato, and said, here's something new. And I kind of went, well, no, not really. Thank you very much. I'm not really interested in that. 
I finally had a light bulb moment that maybe my staff could do better. Uh, I finally got to the point of self-confidence that I can control finances, which basically means I'm sitting on a, a decent fund balance. So if I take a hit on my reserves this year, I won't go broke. I can pay my staff. I can pay people to work for me. And that's my little budget surplus. So if I'm going to go down this route, I better figure out what I'm going to do. So I looked at all of our products, and I basically said, eh, meats are not that great in the nutritional area, but they're very difficult to improve. They're very expensive, very complex issues, blah, blah, blah. Bread's kind of okay, but we put too much butter spray and all that crap on it. Milk's kind of okay. We're not going to mess with that too awfully much. Vegetables are kind of okay, but we really want to use a lot of fresh stuff. So I thought, let's start there. Fresh fruit's okay. Try to quit using so much canned stuff, and let's just try to concentrate on vegetables. And that became really where we started. This is how and I title my thing, my little show that I do, Simple Healthy Foods. Try to use as many fresh products as possible, steaming roasting, replacing salts, fats, and sugars with herbs, spices, and peppers. And finally, in the media, it's kind of like I would like for somebody to pay me this. Years ago, I was saying we need to quit salting stuff and we need to quit adding but butter and striped meat. And if we do, we've got to make things taste better. So we've got to look for that. And now I'm beginning to see school nutrition publications say, hey, we need to teach our staff to use herbs. And it's like, well, duh. Okay. Uh, legumes, wild long grain rice, brown rice, other healthy grain-based items to the menu. We're, and when you tell school nutrition staff, hey, we want to cook more, they think, well, we're just going to peel potatoes and go back to making potatoes from peeled potatoes instead of the dry mix. That's not what we're doing. I'm a little scared of raw proteins. I'll get into that. Uh, we, we are doing some, but not a ton. Um, what to teach? Basic nutrition knowledge. The reason I did that is because my staff does not know nutrition. The average person who walks the street does not know that cheesecake contains 45 grams of fat, 30 of which is saturated, and it's horrible for you. Okay? And they also don't know that I can steam a beautiful plate of steamed carrots and add a ton of margarine to it, and I really haven't helped myself beyond that item that came out of the can. It, we really didn't do anything there. Knife skills, I just wanted them to know how to cut up some things, herbs and their use, which is why I developed... Oh, I see what you mean, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I developed posters. These posters uh, are in my schools. They're not for the students, they're for the staff. One of the first things we did was we tried to show people four or five different common herbs that most people should know and they don't know them. So that, that was part of my teaching thing. That's the teacher and me coming out saying we need to teach them some things like that, okay? And then new recipes. Uh, this is Jason, same, same guy you were referencing, Tom. I actually taught Jason in high school. He's an Elizabethan boy, world-class chef. He came into our district, and, and this you're seeing in the media a lot, this is a big deal. Chefs to schools, Ooh, yeah, that's nice, it's great. Jason added some validity to our program. It was not me saying, look, folks, we need to cook healthier, and it's not that hard to do. It was someone with substance with a degree that was saying that. But I can tell you from the teacher point in me that four hours after Jason left, my staff were not better cookers. They were not knowledgeable of herbs. They were not really ready to go and do the things I wanted them to do. It's nice but it's not a cure-all, and, and, and we seem to just want a, a cure-all. Uh, I had to do some knife training because our knives look like this, right? Okay. That's not the way knives should look, okay, people? Um, that's like a meat cutter's knife, right? This is a fillet knife here for trout season up in Roan Mountain, right? This is for the bread, the big breads that we don't have in school, so it was kind of like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. And, and all along, I thought we had knives in schools and we kind of knew what we were doing. Well, guess what? We didn't. Okay. So now, this is what our knives look like now. Basic chef pairing knives. Uh, we would go into school. I would schedule 10 people to come in and train with me because I actually kind of know how to do some low-level stuff. 10 people would walk in. We would go to our workstations, and we had two knives in the whole school. And that was kind of like, well, this ain't working. So we finally bought ourselves a set of chef's knife, and they go with us, and that way we have training knives. So it's the little things like this I've kind of learned that, that, are, that I have found interesting. Um, one time training by a chef, it's nice, but as far as imparting any real knowledge to your staff, it's useless, okay? You also got to understand finances. 40 staff for five hours is 200 hours. At $10 an hour is 
Chef Jason can come in and talk to my staff for four hours and I simply put $2,000 down the shredder. Was my staff, did my staff gain $2,000 worth of knowledge? I have to make that decision every time I do something like that. Group instruction without hands-on application, from the teacher point of me, doing something as hands-on as cooking is worthless. You're wasting your time, okay? Never underestimate the lack of true cooking knowledge that exists, either in a school nutrition staff or in 95% of the people that you share the grocery store with. People have no clue. It has been lost. I have taught for Tennessee. I've taught for districts other than mine. And really, it, it, it is sad to know how much is lost. Hands-on training works best. Four to eight staff paired up with one or two knowledgeable instructors working for two or three hours, prepping some food works, and it has to be repeated. To, to conduct hands-on training with small groups requires multiple trainings with increased numbers of trainers. I don't have the time to divide my staff into groups of five and spend three hours a day with them. That would, and logistically, if I were to do that, it would take six or eight days in the summer. And I just really don't have that to do. So what I did was I tried to train the trainers. I picked six of my best staff, and I tried to train them on things I wanted them to know. This is just a sample of a training session. Um, and that's, that's where you get people together and you have fun. It, it's really cool. One of the most rewarding things I've done in my adult life, I think, is to get people together and show them some things and cook some things. And these are paid staff of a school system that are paid to come in for six hours a day and prep food, new foods that we haven't seen before that we don't use in school kitchens. And I think real learning occurs there. Okay. Just to let you know, we'll, we'll blow through this. I'm not doing a ton. Red potatoes, roasting a ton of veggies in Bristol, blah, 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 black beans, mixed greens, pinto beans. We dropped that crazy spice salt packet that comes in fake rice, and now we use wild long grain rice. And we actually have garlics and aromatics in our schools and chicken stock. So we do that. So that's pretty cool. All this has been incredibly hilarious to make happen. <laughs> and, and, and frustrating. Uh, we actually make some balsamic dressings. Uh, we're messing around with some chicken sock beans and stuff like that. So we're just trying to improve little things at a time. Uh, pictures, right? That's what we don't want. That's what we now have. And I'll come back to, do remind me about that. Asparagus is a, is a cool food. Most kids don't like it. It's terribly, terribly expensive and it degrades quickly. We don't do that so much anymore. We'll put it in stuff, but as far as pure asparagus, we're not trying that. Black beans, peas, these are roasted vegetables, right? Squash, zucchini. We're doing that and having fairly good success with it. We can track all this stuff through our system. Uh, butternut squash, probably sweet potatoes, peas, parsnips up here. Oh, I'm sorry, beets, parsnips, sweet potatoes, roasted. Some cool stuff. I know this is silly. Bear with me. <laughs> this is simply roasted potatoes with rosemary and olive oil, right? That's the way they should look. It is very hard to get that to happen among seven schools with people who really aren't passionate. They are passionate, but they're not educated and they didn't grow up doing this. This didn't occur two weeks after I taught staff how to do it. This occurred nine or 10 months into a school year when I went out to one of the schools and went, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad I got out of my office. Somebody finally did it right, okay? Um, then, then you finally make all these nice things, and guess what? <laughs> Kids won't eat them, <laughs> right? Okay. So, we have worked a little bit. This is Angie Gilmer. She's with the YWCA in Bristol, and she's got a passion for food. We worked with her doing a sampling program, and in the past, we've been to school systems, or we've heard about school systems that do this sampling program, and they stand at the cash register and put a piece of food on each kid's plate that comes through which you might as well put it in the trash can and save yourself some trouble because the kids won't touch it, okay? So she goes around and really, truly interacts with the kids and, and promotes healthy eating, talks with the kids. They know her. She takes food to them. We give them small samples, okay? And we interact with them, tell them why it's good and that kind of thing. Uh, it's one of those crazy things. If you have a ringleader at a table or if you have a group of kids and you take their pictures, they'll eat dirt, okay? <laughs> All right. So that's kind of it. So that's kind of what we do there. We finally learned that um, you could take a picture of a kid, and that's kind of cool. All right, sweet, sweet people here. You get the principal involved, eat some nice things. 
And then we also finally learned that you can grab their buddies together, you can get multiple kids in more than one pitcher, and, and they, they'll try it. They'll try good foods. Uh, this was, and we've also done some other things like that. It's ginger root. Kids have never seen ginger root. We did fresh pineapples at my school this year. A lot of kids have never seen fresh pineapples, right? I had to go tell my staff, show my staff how to cut fresh pineapples. We're used to it coming in a black, brown box in the back door, right? We even put the pineapple on the, on the table to decorate the cups of fresh pineapple. And when we ran out of pineapple, some little kid wanted to buy the pineapple top. I'm not exactly sure why, <laughs> but, okay? Your staff has got to do different things. They've got to learn to taste and sample foods. If you're cooking from a brown box, if you're cooking from a frozen box, it tastes the same as it did last week. It'll taste the same as it did next week. You've got to learn to taste and sample foods. The basil you got in last week may not be very strong. The basil you get in this week may be considerably different. Experiment with cooking temps and times. You actually got to walk in the walk-in refrigerator and look beyond the menu item, right? If today's broccoli day, but you got cauliflower that's going bad, you might ought to use that instead of throwing it in the trash, okay? Never underestimate, I've got this in here twice, never underestimate the lack of cooking knowledge that staff possess. And I'm not busting on my staff, I'm really talking about the population in general. It is absolutely amazing. Don't train one time and expect it to last, you've got to train continually. You make these beautiful new foods and you've got to show kids to it, you've got to introduce them to new foods. And we are still looking for ways to improve our proteins, which is a source of the high fat, high salt kind of thing that we want to try and move away from. I do have to give you a little bit of humor. We brought some beautiful carrots in, 55, oh, 25, 25 pound bag of carrots, right? Multicolored carrots, just wanted to show them to the kids, which we did. And I said, well, rather than throw them away, let's just clean them, cut them into carrot sticks, we'll serve them the next day. My staff leave at 1.30, I said, okay, you two stay here and do those. We'll have them ready for the next day. Work over past 1.30. I came in the next day, and the girl goes, I was almost late for church. And I went, what time does your church start? She said, 6.30. We were there till 5 o'clock cleaning those things, and it was two staff from 1.30 to 5 o'clock cleaning 25 pounds of carrots. I am serious. It was like six hours worth of employee time. Those carrots cost us about 150 bucks in employee time. And I'm going, are you serious? And they were dead on serious that it took them that long to do. And I just don't think they had the experience. So thinking that they may have slammed me and just sat around for three hours, I actually, in my evil mind, bought another 25-pound pound bag of carrots, sent them to another school, and said, you all do the same thing, and got the exact same results. Okay, so. Um, in one of our knife training sessions, I've got this teacher whom I've taught, I've spent, hours with these six people over the summer saying, let me show you how to do things. Let me show you how to cook. And so this teacher is now teaching six other people, and I go in, and they've got the horrible knives out. And I go, what, why do you have the horrible knives out? What happened to our great set of knives? And she said, we put them away because they were sharp and we were afraid to cut ourselves. <laughs> and that's one of those days when instead of going out from your office and going, I am so glad I got out of my office, you just shake your head, walk out the back door and go, I should have never left the office. Okay, so that's, that's kind of, um, this is interesting. I actually received an email, and this will just emphasize, um, it's somewhat humorous. It's not that humorous. I got just an email. I, t I teach for the state, and some folks in the, that I do that. Uh, this is a director in West Tennessee of a small district about my size, and she said, I was touring around my schools. We noticed things like the broccoli was overcooked at one school, was not cooked at another. Got me to thinking we need some basic culinary training. Well, duh. And I guess, and they wanted me to come teach their staff how to steam broccoli, 150 people in a lecture type environment. And I basically said, really, you're, I would be wasting your time. I'd be wasting your money. It's not going to work. Okay. And the other thing that kind of struck me about this was like, really, you can't go out and teach your staff to steam broccoli? You can't get on the internet and learn about it? There's a few things you should be able to figure out yourself. So somewhat humorous, maybe not, but it, it, re it really brought home, it really brought home the point of the state of affairs of where we're at. Uh, farmer's market. I, just, I take my camera everywhere for pictures with the kids. Buy at your local State Street Farmer's Market, and he's coming back from the Asheville Produce Market, right? That's not exactly local grown produce. Okay. It's not funny, but it is, right? So, and, and, and interestingly enough, 
That's my tax dollars, right? That's our tax dollars right here competing against this. And in closing, my wife's a teacher. Teachers bust on me about our meals more than anything. They actually like them, but they'll certainly tell you what they don't like. That's a meal that the teachers want me to give. Sorry, and that's it. Thank you. All right, we'll continue in the theme. Um, in closing the evening, we'll hear from Sally Causey. And Sally is the Executive Director of Rural Resources, which is a nonprofit connecting farms to communities in Greenville, Tennessee. She's held this position of the position of Executive Director since 1996 and has guided Rural Resources through the development of their mobile farmers market and their farm and food training program, which she'll share about this evening. So. Um. Rural Resources' mission, in a, in a nutshell, is to connect farms, food, and families. Um, when we first got started um, back in the early 90s, we had a bumper sticker that said, no farms, no food. Um, and the statistic, the horrible statistic, that between 1982 and 1992, Green County lost 15 acres of farmland every single day. And I think in the next 10 year period, it improved to 10 acres of farmland a day. But somebody pointed out that we had less farmland to lose. So sad situation um, starting out. Um, the other grueling statistic that we have to work with as we think about the future of food is that the average age of farmers in Northeast Tennessee is 58. So, we're obviously trying to work very hard to change these statistics. And one of the things that we've done is start a mobile farmer's market, and I'll, I'll mention that. But what I really want to, and we we're also um, connecting that to some farm to school work and some farm to hospital work. But what I really want to focus on tonight is how we're involving youth in agriculture and hopefully um, leave everybody um, feeling a little bit hopeful. So this is um, a picture of our mobile farmer's market. We had a, a bus donated to us by the Green County school system that they were retiring, and we turned it into a little farmer's market as a way to both um, help farmers have a way to sell their produce and also as a way to transport produce to folks in our community that didn't necessarily have the ability to get to the local farmers markets because of lack of transportation. And that's something that we hear about a lot of times in urban areas areas. Um, you might hear the term food desert used where folks um, have a difficult time accessing good healthy food. And we found the same is true in our rural community. Um, through with the mobile farmers market, we are um, getting some local food into our local Tacoma hospital. And we're also working really hard with our local school systems to try to um, overcome all the challenges um, to sell local food there. But to concentrate um, on the, the hopeful side of things, the thing that we found is that, um, like our, our speaker before, um, children especially don't often know where their food comes from. And so in order to, to bridge that gap, we want to help children experience where their food comes from. So back in 1997, 15 summers ago, we started bringing children out to the farm where Rural Resources is located to have farm day camp. And we um, milk the, the cow with them and we involve them in actually growing food and taking care of livestock, that kind of thing. And it's just a fun thing. You know, we, we really, they don't really know that they're learning anything. We keep that a secret, but truly, you know, they learn so much just simply experiencing where their food comes from. And, you know, you might say, well, you know, what kind of impact does this make? What kind of difference does this make? And while we haven't um, done the formal study, that's something that we need to do. What I do know is that after 15 summers, a lot of those children that we started with are now adults. Um, I'm, you know, I run into their mothers and I hear that they're having babies and they're off at college doing great things and, um, you know, really they are our, our new consumers. I mean, maybe even somebody in this room came to Farm Day Camp at Rural Resources. So um, we just feel like we have to start at the very beginning and try to get them enthusiastic and knowledgeable about where their food comes from. 
But the th other thing that I really want to share with you that's so absolutely exciting is our farm and food training program for teenagers. And the way this came about was we started working with kids, not just at farm day camp, but in the school system. And I realized that at some point these kids were going to graduate from elementary school and here we had built relationships and at some point we were going to miss them, um, you know, miss their, um, you know, their personalities and, you know, their great minds and, and all of that. And so I started thinking, well, how can we keep them involved? How can we keep them involved in, in local food? And I thought, well, maybe they'd like to cook. So we um, got them involved in a cooking program, but then we realized, well, they still need more of that understanding of where the food comes from, you know, before you get to the cooking stage. So we started this program um, that has grown into a four-year program where teenagers first come and spend a year at the farm. This is, they come out every other week um, for a couple of hours, and they um, get involved with taking care of the livestock, and they get involved with growing a garden, and really just learn. Um, we, this picture down here is of Mark, and it was taken just the other day, and oh my gosh, I can't tell you how proud he was of those carrots that he pulled out. And he was like, I grew those carrots. They came from my garden. My garden is the best. And it was just, it was so great to, to just see that. And you can see by the smile on his face how proud he is of the carrots. So after they, they work at the farm for a year, they then go on to work with local chefs in local church kitchens for a year, and they learn to cook, and just all of the basics. And then they also get experience catering, which is um, a really interesting endeavor um, to cater with a whole bunch of kids. Um, we, um, for the last several years, have catered a meal in the late summer at Muncie Memorial in Johnson City. So if anybody has connections with Muncie Memorial, hopefully we'll be back over there in August or September catering a big meal. So that's a great experience for the kids. And then after they've done those two years in the program, they um, work with their group to start a small business that relates to farms, the farm, or to food. And they, um, at this stage, we have them planning the business for a year and doing a business plan, that kind of thing. And then in the fourth year, they actually implement their business. So we're just trying to take it full circle and help them not just know where it all comes from and how it gets prepared, but really how to use these skills for, um, you know, for future endeavors. And so now we're going from no farms, no food to this kind of no farms, no food. And I'm just going to stop there and, and keep it brief. Um, All right, well, thank, thanks to all the speakers. We have a couple of minutes. If any of you have any specific questions for our speakers this evening? No, no recipe questions. Yes? Where is the uh, ETSU Farmer's Market located? Where is the ETSU Farmer's Excellent Market question. located? question. It is in the parking lot between the Culp Center and Student Health Services, so actually right in front of where we are right now. Uh, Thursdays from 9.30 to 1 o'clock. And today was the first day, and it was very successful. And Rachel arranged for good weather in the morning, not so good in the <laughs> evening. All right, well, I want to thank, um, let's give a, a round of applause for all the speakers one more time. And also for our two masters of ceremony, for all that they did. Um, be before you go, we're going to have each speaker come up and receive a plaque um, that confers upon each of them, including our two masters of ceremony, the status of humanitarian scholar in the College of Public Health. Uh, for participating in this evening's Leading Voices event. And I hope that you all appreciate the range of issues that were covered tonight. So a lot was covered in a very short period of time. Thanks to Rachel and Camille for helping set it up.
Uh, as I mentioned, this is the last Leading Voices event for this academic year. If there are topics or speakers that you'd like to see covered next year, uh, please let me know. I'm available by email or telephone. Uh, thank you all very much for your attendance. I'm going to ask the speakers and the MCs if they would come forward. And Larry, do you mind? We'll get a group picture of all of them. Thank you all very much, and have a safe drive home.